So welcome today to this final session for the Food Network meeting. Um, I just really like to say that I'll be maybe chatting a little bit in between, but some of the things that are available through um, Food for Life get togethers in the Soil Association project, some ideas about Share and Cook, and also I'll send out after this session some things for World Food Day. World Food Day is on Saturday the 16th of October and it's, um, it's a good time to think about the food we eat, how the impact on other countries and how you will have noticed in many TV adverts and programmes and across your communities how, how we access food is changing, how food is changing. We're encouraged to eat less meat and there's all sorts of changes to the way things are going to be for our future and especially with COP26 coming up, all environmental things coming up and looking at intergenerational work specifically around food, it's so rich. It's just so rich. There's so much that we can learn from older people. We can also learn from younger people and we can share that knowledge uh, right through from you know, the cooking of food and preparing of food, the changes in food across generations to now, looking at fast food culture, looking at growing, growing food, growing in our communities, biodiversity, and I suppose cooking food and sharing with others, and even realising about holiday hunger, about people in our communities who are, you know, if you look at eat well, age well, you look at older people who are undernourished, malnourished, loneliness and isolation so the food the whole area of food covers so much um that you know we'd we could spend like two hours talking about one one subject alone so today's um we have three really good guest speakers today and we have a real richness with them today um starting with eugenie uh, now uh, eugenie arachev is arachev did I get this correct? Because I'm not, but sometimes I'm not so brilliant with names. So from Grow 70, G73, which is Grow 73 in Rutherglen, which stands for the postcode G73, which I thought was really such a good name and there's so much meaning to it. And then we have Jenny from Chellis, and I've not got Jenny's a surname and I haven't got my thing in front of me. So uh, Jenny, from Trellis, what's your surname? Simpson. So it is, so it is. I think <laughs> my, my brain must be thinking this morning with too many people phoning me at the one time. We'll be speaking a bit about Trellis practice and the kind of things that you can do intergenerationally with others uh, about gardening. And then we have Emma Halliday, who's going to speak about Hi, Emma, about uh, funding and funding opportunities. And uh, we also have John Mitchell, if he's here. He's going to talk about something at the very end. Hi, John Mitchell. Hello. So I'm just, without anything more, I'm going to hand you over to Eugenie. And, and Eugenie is going to speak about Grow 73. So welcome, everyone. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah, it maybe could be a bit louder, but we can hear you. Right, okay. Um, good to see everyone here and thank you for inviting me today to speak. Um, just to start, so our group, we are trying to only, we've been a charity for three years now, um, but we have been existing for six years on a voluntary basis. Uh, based in Rutherglen. Um, the group was set up by Lynn, my friend, and myself. And the idea Excuse was me, that... I'm sorry, I can't hear at all. Um, I'm trying to put the volume up. I can't hear. That's as much. Sorry, um, I, I'm the same, it's very muffled. Okay, do you, know what we could, do you know what we could maybe do? What we'll do is we'll go on to Jenny just now and we'll come back to Eugenie and I'll go and work with Eugenie at getting her volume sorted, okay? So we'll do that and that means we can go and resolve that because that can happen to all of us. And I'll go and work with Eugenie. We'll turn our cameras off. Um, so I introduce you to Jenny. Sorry about that, Jenny. And um, Jenny's going to actually speak now from Trellis 
and she has a slide to share with you, but she's going to hi, say hi, and then go through uh, the information from Trellis. Thank okay. you, Jenny. <laughs> Thanks, Bella. <laughs> Hi folks, um, I've got uh, I've got a short PowerPoint to share with you, but um, I'm uh, Jenny Simpson and I'm from Trellis. And for those of you who haven't heard of Trellis, which is quite possible because we're quite a small organisation, we keep a low profile, but we hope to have a good impact. Um, we support people in care, education and community settings to garden with their clients. So if you haven't gardened ever or you have gardened in the past and you would like to sort of refresh your skills or you just want to be able to do some gardening um, with your client group then Trellis is an organisation that can help you to do that. So um, we are based in Perth and um, we have some information online. We have a, a website that you can go to to have a look at our resources. Um, but I've got links on this um, PowerPoint to our resources and I'm going to talk you through some of the things that we can support you with. And um, I'm hoping that Bella can share the, um, the links and the PowerPoint with you after this session. So I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my, excuse me, share my screen with you and uh, talk through some of the slides that I have here about um, gardening. And it's about fun gardening. So I'm just going to um, share and share my slides. Grand. Now, I hope you can all see this. Um, I'm not very good at multitasking, so you'll have to just kind of bear with me a moment until I get myself <laughs> organised. So if somebody could give me the thumbs up to tell me that they can see my... Yeah, slide. we can we can see it, Jenny. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's great. Okay, now I've just got to find a bit where I can click on to the next slide. That'd be great. So thanks very much for having me along today. It's uh, great to have an opportunity to uh, talk to you about gardening. And um, it can be a great fun activity and it can contribute to um, your well-being in lots of ways. So there's lots of um, physical um, benefits you can get from gardening, from a large um, muscle and small muscles um, you can put to use. You can be standing, you can be sitting, you can be walking, you can be sitting down to it. Um, you can, there's lots of um, opportunities to practice hand and eye coordination. Um, and there's lots of opportunities to be social about gardening. So it's a great tool to get people together to do an activity. But it's also something that you can do on a one to one basis. And it's also something you can do by yourself. So it's very much lends itself to being adaptable to um, the people and the person, uh, their likes and dislikes and their abilities. Uh, there's also lots of emotional benefits you can get from gardening because it provides all these social interactions or it provides connection to nature, which is an important thing that we're learning more and more about. So it can contribute to your overall well-being, um, and that's everybody's, every age group, um, young and old. So, um, as I said before, you don't need green fingers to garden. You can do it from scratch. You don't have to have any knowledge at all. So um, it's very adaptable to any age group and it provides opportunities to bring people together, to talk, to share skills, to work towards a shared goal and to have fun together. And um, this photograph was taken at the Generations Working Together conference back in 2020. And um, myself and my colleague Joan, who's in this picture, were there with our stall talking about gardening and how you can get gardening. Uh, with your groups. So it's uh, something that uh, generations working together are uh, keen to promote. So you don't need green fingers, you certainly don't need a garden. And um, we would say, please start small. If you haven't gardened before, if, you, if you're not really very sure of what, about what you're doing, don't think you have to have a huge garden to do anything. It's not like that at all. Um, there's lots of opportunities to do tabletop gardening activities with your clients. Um, so you can do those indoors and out. Basically, you need a table, a, work, a surface to work on. You can have chairs or you can stand. 
it's up to you to decide what's uh, best for your client group. And to help you do that, we have several resources. We have activity sheets that you can download and try out. That's lots of simple gardening ideas, uh, simple gardening activities. We have what we call our seasonal gardening resource packs as well. You can buy those from the trail shop. We have our YouTube channel that's got lots of how-to videos about to do simple tabletop activities. Uh, and we have what we call our live Zoom sessions, which are live online gardening demonstrations. Um, we've just launched a new season of them for the autumn, and you can sign up to those uh, online at Trellis. And we're just about to publish um, a gardening activities book where you get 52 activities. Uh, it takes you through the whole year um, of uh, gardening. So there's lots of um, resources to be had. And there's lots of other websites out there as well. If you're, if you're on, the, on the web and you want to have a little search about gardening, there's lots of um, help out there. So, as I said, you don't, you don't need a garden, you can use your windowsill. So um, if you want to have a try, you can um, easily grow some things at this time of year. And these are things I can recommend that you could try just now. So you could sprout cress on your windowsill. And uh, cress, as you know, you can have that. That's a great addition that provides vitamin C and added um, uh, lovely green flavonoids to your um, sandwiches. So you can have it with cress and also, uh, egg sandwiches and all sorts of different things. Put it on salads. You can sprout seeds on your windowsill. So you can sprout seeds and use them in a stir fry. That's possible. Uh, you can grow spring onions at the moment and you can grow lots of different herbs and spices on your windowsill. And I'm going to come back to that in a little while. Or if you're not motivated to grow things to eat, um, why not just create a feast for the eyes and um, you can have a vase of flowers. Why not just start with some simple flower arranging, you know, put some flowers in a vase. That's a lovely thing to do. It's a really nice uh, tabletop activity to do with a client group. Um, perhaps, you know, you can talk about the colours and the fragrance, the smells, the textures, and you can, um, you can all take part in um, putting together a vase of flowers or you can each create your own it's, uh, it's a lovely thing to do and uh, of course if you don't want to do that you can also have lots of colourful flowering pot plants on your windowsills um, there's loads and loads out there in supermarkets and garden centres and uh, it can make all the difference um, studies in Japan have shown that having a flowering plant in the room lowers people's blood pressure so that's a very interesting a concept and it's certainly something to bear in mind. Lots of people, people respond to flowers and flowering plants and it's a lovely thing to have to um, stimulate conversation and reminiscence. So um, you could also uh, grow herbs on your windowsill and this is what I want to talk to you about because it's so simple, so easy and it's very easy to get a hold of um, herbs because they're in every supermarket. Supermarkets now grow uh, uh, sorry, sell uh, herbs that are grown in pots. So you can buy them in the supermarket with the shopping. It's very easy. And uh, you can have a bit of a, a think here about what you like to eat. If you're into Italian food and uh, you maybe want to think about what to put on your pizza topping or you want to include in a um, spaghetti bolognese, you can go for uh, some herbs such as basil and thyme and oregano or rosemary and sage. And these will all grow happily on indoors on your windowsill in Scotland at this time of year. So have a little uh, look, at, look at them next time you're in the supermarket and have a think about that. Uh, if you're into Indian dishes, you can think about growing um, herbs such as coriander. You could um, sprout some ginger on your windowsill. Um, there's mint, that's a lovely one to grow. Uh, cardamom and curry leaf. And they all grow very easily on your windowsill too. Um, next, thinking about um, growing some things outdoors, and certainly in the summertime, it's a great opportunity to grow lots of salad. This is a photograph of what grows outside my back door. Um, I've got lots of <coughs> varieties of lettuce, and um, I've also what have I got there? I've got a rosemary plant, 
and I've got um, some chives, I think, there. So there's lots of opportunity to grow things at your back door. And why I'm saying grow them at your back door is that it's very, that it's very accessible. You walk past it every day. It's easy to see when it needs watering. Uh, when and it's easy to pick and take into the kitchen and use to cook and that's the thing you want you want convenience um, you know you want the convenience of the supermarket from your garden and of course you get much much fresher food if you grow it yourself um, and you get all the goodness uh, that's in that fresh food as well so you know from uh, picking it to putting it on your plate you know it's just a few minutes and uh, so that's excellent um, excellent nutrition so um, also in your doorway, you can think about um, growing some wildlife attracting plants. For example, lavender is a lovely thing to have. Um, not only does it smell good, you can bake with it. Um, and it also attracts bees and um, bees and pollinators are great um, things to uh, attract to your gardens or your uh, outdoor spaces and um, because they pollinate other plants and food important in the food chain. It's very good to encourage as many of them as you can. And um, of course, create a floral display to lift the spirits. It's lovely, isn't it? Everyone notices uh, a nice display if you're going in and out of someone's home or um, perhaps a residential home. Another idea is to grow some edible flowers. They're fun to grow. And uh, there's lots and lots of varieties that grow very easily um, in our climate and you can grow them in a pot, uh, a large pot at your, um, in your garden or at your front door or wherever you would like to have it. And uh, why not benefit from them as, and eat them as well? So there's lots on this list and um, Thompson and Morgan have a fantastic uh, online uh, description of flowers to, to grow. So I won't run through all of them, but um, a, neat, a very easy one to try and start with is nasturtiums. Try them. They're beautiful flowers. They're um, a flower that uh, grows very easily from seed. And um, it uh, is one of those flowers that people recognize from their childhood or from their own gardening experiences because it's a lovely uh, plant to grow. Uh, and you can also eat it. Uh, it's like it tastes very peppery. It's got peppery leaves and you can eat the flowers as well. So it's an interesting one to, to start with and very easy to grow. So I would recommend that one. And uh, for more information, have a look at the Thompson and Morgan website. Um, so we've we've talked about um, the floor space and we've talked about the windowsill space, but now let's think about the wall space outdoors. If you don't have a garden, a large garden space, think about using the wall space to create uh, a space for growing. So the, the traditional things to have hanging baskets and uh, you can think about hanging baskets in lots of different ways. Many of traditionally have um, lots of flowers in them, so they're very like big floral displays. Um, but you can have a hanging basket with fruit and vegetables in it. And uh, this is a photograph of one that's just been planted up with strawberries. You can see young strawberry plants here, the green strawberries right, getting ready to uh, fatten up and grow nice and red. And this plant beside it with slightly different leaves, sort of longer pointed leaves, is a toma tumbling tomato. So you can grow uh, tomato plants and uh, strawberry plants in a hanging basket. And if you want more um, inspiration on what to grow in hanging baskets, you can go on the Trails YouTube channel and we have a great uh, how to uh, hanging basket video, which uh, is terrific. And um, my colleague, Joan Wilson, uh, does lots of practical demonstrations of how to do this so it's uh, it's good fun and it's a great thing for to share with your clients and um, get them to help plant up so it's something that you can be doing uh, certainly more of a summer activity but we have a live zoom coming up um, to create an autumn hanging basket so you might be interested in that if you want to register online for that and um, that's happening on the 7th uh, in fact when's that that's Thursday it's happening on Thursday afternoon. And so but I'll talk more about that later, how to sign up. Um, still thinking about wall space, you can create a green wall by fixing containers to the wall. Um, we're looking overseas here for our inspiration because the Spanish are excellent at doing this. And um, if you ever get the opportunity to go to um, Spain in May, 
please, please go to Cordova because they have a fantastic patio festival and um, they open all the patios up to the public and you can go around and see all these beautiful, beautiful um, patios We're absolutely festooned with flowers and beautiful uh, plants. Um, so if you can't get there, of course, you can always look online and have a look at it virtually, but it's really worth a look and um, perhaps some of your clients would just like to have a little tour of, um, of this. It's great, a great thing to share. So if you've if you've been a bit if you've been a bit inspired by this, you might want some more free training, and we can certainly give you that. Um, as I've uh, spoken about, we do live demonstration sessions, and these are usually on a Thursday afternoon. We've got a few coming up, as I mentioned, the autumn hanging basket on the seventh of October, but we've got um, some different um, activities coming up too. We've got one about composting. If you ever want to know anything about composting, we've got something on about that. And we've got a very special workshop on the 28th of October called Mindfulness in the Garden. And um, it is being led by our guest, um, Deb Becker, who's a specialist mental health occupational therapist. And she's leading this session and you can find out all about how to lead a mindfulness session uh, with your clients and um, get the benefits of um, the outdoors as well. So it's great, it's a great, uh, activity to be doing. Uh, then in November we've got a session on small space gardening and then at the end of November we've got one on festive floristry so that's great if you want to make something for the kitchen uh, for the kitchen for the Christmas table uh, or you're, you've got a Christmas fair coming up and you'd like to your residents to want to make something to sell then it's a great one to join in and find out how to do some simple festive floristry. Um, as I said just register to attend these they're all free we often have free giveaways as well and um, if you're in the session and um, you give us some feedback at the end we send you off some um, stuff so that you can try these activities out yourself so here's a list of resources as I've, I've been talking about um, please get in touch with us if you'd like any help we can advise on um, garden design and um, just using gardening activity in general uh, with your clients and we're very happy to talk things through and um, bounce ideas help you bounce ideas and just um, just get you started if you've never had a go before that's what we're really keen to do so thanks very much for listening There was so much in there, so I got I got handy tips. So that was really good as well. And remember, everyone, um, questions and answers after both speakers. So we're going to go on to the next speaker. I can see that Alan's got his hand up as well. If we can keep the questions until after Eugenie's been, is that okay? Sorry. Um, thank you, Jenny. And also, um, you know, thinking along the lines of intergenerational stuff as well as separate and together, it's about sharing with the whole community. So there's quite a lot of information there. I'll be sharing the slides and we'll do questions and answers after Eugenie. Now, Eugenie's had the situation resolved. However, she's coming in on her phone and our lovely Laureen is going to share Eugenie's PowerPoint and we'll just have a chat with Eugenie as well. So she's worked out how to resolve the situation sort of. So there you go. Well done, Eugenie, for that one. So um, we're just going to get started. Thank you. Apologies, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah, great. Um, so Grow73 is a community-led uh, um, charity which has been in existence for six years now based in Rutherglen in South Lanarkshire just on the edge of Glasgow and um, we started really the group because um, two young two mums with uh, children spending a lot of time in green spaces and realizing that there wasn't much outdoor activities or growing spaces for our children to do and we thought well maybe this could be something to venture in so a few years um a few a few months down the line approached a council asked if we could use some space in our in our local park overton park and there was a small plot um there uh, just around um 
piece of uh, land and the council said you can have it um, and if you do if you do good work then we can let you develop more um, areas in the park so this is really how it started um, we worked with local uh, groups um, the men, like the men's sheds but it's also open for the for women um, and um, if you're not familiar to them they're a great resource to getting stuff made for nothing really they, they generally ask for donation but it's a great way to work with uh, in an intergenerational way actually um, because it's men who are retired men and women who are retired who would use their skills and um to to build things for you so we got some raised beds done and the idea was that um whatever we grew there was for the use of our community from there um, <clears throat> we realized that Quickly, there was an interest in, in a community about and um, a curiosity about growing food. Um, we found out about Eden Project, who were doing um, a, a big lunch, um, and which happens every year. And, and the idea is to reduce loneliness, invite your neighbours to share a picnic, um, and um, and that happens once a year, the, I think it's the first week in June. So we, we signed up for that and, and did the big lunch. And you can see on the photo in the middle, there's a big long table with lots of people coming. And um, that was an amazing event. Um, um, over 200 people turned up of all age group. We had bands come, a band coming to play. We had storytellers. Um, lots of free activities and people people just brought their picnic and um, and it was a great way to, to sort of um, just make new friends and this has become for us one of the one of the events that we don't like missing out because people ask for it and they always turn up in in hundreds so we've been doing it for six years and it's really successful on the back of this we were invited at Eden project for a community um, camp which run for about three or four days. Um, and that was really inspirational because we met lots of organization, other community groups and got an understanding of what they were doing in the, in the communities. And um, we met with the incredible edible movement, um, the people who are behind that, Pam Warm Warhurst, she wasn't there herself, but highly highly inspirational and the idea is that actually you use any green space in your community and you grow um, food um, vegetables herbs um, fruits flowers for your community to use and you don't need to ask for permission you just go and help yourself if you've got a roast to do you just go and get a sprig of something and we love that concept so we just started lots of different we started to identify lots of little pockets in that area and um and then went on to adopt rather Glen train station um i think we can move to the next slide um uh, which was also part of so that, that will come after rather Glen train station was really about people arrive in rather Glen. there's one one million 1.2 million commuters that come through rather Glen and they don't really stop in rather Glen. it's just been neglected over the years it's a it's a community that has that was thriving um during its its good times and after that it became one of the most um uh, uh, deprived areas in Scotland and we felt that when you arrive at the train station there was actually nothing to say hi we love our community welcome come and see what's happening so we we took over the planters and started to grow some um, strawberries and some herbs um, and after that we uh, we realized that um, maybe the fruits and veg were not going to last because it was really windy so then we we are actually uh, volunteers are really keen on uh, biodiversity in general and um, we've got some amazing uh, passionate people who love bees and and pollinators and uh, as well as uh, wildflowers and quickly we realized that that was something that brought them out quite a lot and we felt that we needed to listen to them their interest so um we grew some loads of flowers to actually increase the pollinators in the area. 
while this was happening, we were having great momentum of our community and we felt that we still needed some space and we didn't have a base and people didn't know who we were and it was really hard to um, know how to go about that. So we realised that the bowling club in the middle of Overton Park had four greens but only used one. And we approached them and said, could we possibly use the three um, uh, uh, greens that you're not using for community growing food? And they were like, well, you'll have to go back to the council and you'll have to find out. Anyway, down the line, we got an asset transfer for the three disused bowling green. It took three years of that effort, which was quite um, red tape sometimes can they put communities off, but we were very determined. Anyway, we got an asset transfer. And this land, as you see it there, is all of that land. And what's interesting is that the back of the line of trees right at the back is a care home. So we've got some agreement with the care home to actually open up so that the users can actually come through the, through the community growing um, project and actually be part of it. We also work, you can see on that photo, we've got little children from uh, the nurseries locally. We work a lot with children from nurseries and various um, schools. And um, our work has always been about um, intergenerational work. Um, our volunteers start from the age of three um, and go on to 80 plus. And it's great actually to see that happening because um, for myself, who has no family in this country, my neighbors became my children's adopted grandparents. And that was one way to actually get my children to engage locally. And for my, for my neighbors who didn't have grandchildren, for them to feel that they had grandchildren. And that's been really the focus of our work is really being fought for about who, who are the people who live in the community. So this land is now, um, I don't know, what's the next state? Uh, could you get to the next slide? Yeah, that's it. So as you can see there, um, we've, got, we've, we've got one green, which is the bowling green, and we've actually split the three areas, keeping the kind of idea of the layouts of the three um, bowling greens. One area will be the social area, which um, is about uh, all the tools and growing together, learning together. Uh, cooking together we just got some money we just installed a, a composting toilet because there's absolutely no toilet facility in the area and that's big that's a big problem for people coming out actually not having facilities to cater for them um, we've also going to have a, a big area the yellow area is not no longer going to be a biodiversity but it's going to be outdoor growing so a big polytunnel so that people can grow all year round and the blue area is actually going to be an area where we are going to rewild that area just to um, have little pockets of intimate gardens to just rest and, and um, just peaceful area and then the woodland area, which was a discovery that wasn't part, that wasn't supposed to be part of the project, but that's it. We've realized that it's such a big tunnel of, um, of trees and we're going to use this area for a, a natural play area for children. And it's all enclosed in a fence, which means that actually it's safe for children to be left and, and for anyone to feel in a safe environment. All this land was actually in the center of the park and had been locked for 15 years with no one being able to access it or use it. So I think that's one thing is if in your own area you find a piece of land, go and inquire about it and go and find out if it's possible for you to use it because this can open up so many opportunities for so many different people. So as part of this, this has taken three years um, we didn't want to be just stop all our activities just because we were bogged down with some asset transfer and, and trying to raise money to just um, uh, tackle our, our planning conditions, which were to fence and to create some paths. And all this costs us £24,000. So all these things are expensive um, and communities often struggle to find those kind of money before they've even started to develop their community garden. So you have to be thoughtful about um, your relationship with councils and, and whoever you're going to get land from. Anyway, lockdown happened and um, 
we still wanted to be able to offer uh, growing activities for our uh, community and um, were really thinking about how could we do that. So we went back to the green areas of um, growing that we had allocated, that we had found along the roads that goes from Rutherglen train station and links another big park and we thought how can we do that so we got money from um we got money from um the lottery national lottery to develop a beeline and this was to basically identify lots of those little pockets all along Stonelow road which goes from Rutherglen train station and links up all those little green pockets all the way up for over a distance of 2.6 miles and um, get some kind of uh, only, only nectar rich flowers, which would attract um, bees and pollinators. Lockdown happened and we couldn't um, physically do this with, with people. So we thought, well, how could we do that? So we ended up doing growing kits and those uh, first lockdown was an egg box with lots of seeds in them. Some of them were vegetables and some of them were pollinator friendly flowers. And we delivered those by hand to everyone in the community who asked for one. And we never realized that this was going to be such an impactful um, uh, thing to do. So 150, no, 250, sorry, uh, growing kits were given to the communities, some of which were isolating not being able to um, access a garden. Um, and so growing from indoors or on the path, on the patio, um, we got some, I think the next slide has got quite a few. Um, so that's the biodiversity. These are all the areas that we're growing, but the next one, um, Bella, that's it. Those were the comments from people who grew um, for, the, for, a lot, for a lot of them, it was for the first time and it was the impact it had on them to actually take part in growing for the first time peas and didn't know that that's the shape they were going to have and stuff like that. So it was really encouraging. By the time um, lockdown three came, we thought, well, it's winter, it's a hard time for people. How can we get people to keep active and help us with this beeline? And um, what we ended up doing is growing kits made out of coffee sacks uh, that we recycled and we filled them with some compost provided some potato seeds because potatoes is always a good one for people to um, get started uh, it's an exciting one for children and at the same time we provided them with some wildflower seeds for the bee line and so if they were successful with the flowers, then they would keep some for their own garden, but then they would add them to our bee lines where we had lots of planters along the roots and people would come out during their walk and add them to the bee line. And this ended up being 420 um, growing um, kits that we provided um, to schools, to um, older folks, to any, anyone who asked them. Um, and it got the attention from BBC Country File, who came to film us um, as part of their Plant Britain Spring Special. Um, and this was really a great thing to do. And now the, what we've, part of, some of our um, volunteers, as I said, are really passionate about um, insects in general and have gone along the bee line to see if actually we had increased the biodiversity in the area. And they have taken um, photos of bees and and also and butterflies and other pollinators, um, which wouldn't have been there um, otherwise. So it just shows that you actually don't need much to to um, attract pollinators. Um, so using your windowsill, as someone said early on, is a great way to uh, attract um, pollinators. Um, part of the work that we do is working with schools. We develop um, growing, um, uh, growing uh, activities within school grounds. And the bee line was one of the things where schools really wanted to be part of um, and have asked if they could have the kits. And then they're asking us now if we can come and help them grow um, wildflower um, meadows within the school grounds, which is great to see. 
but also none of the work that we do could happen without um, partnership. Partnership is really key to a lot of the work that we do. So we developed a, a green network called Green in Cam Glen, and the idea of that is to avoid duplication. Thank you, Bella. Avoid duplication of effort. Um, use care as skill share um, whenever possible. Um, so, for instance, during the delivery of the growing kits, we didn't have a van, and 400 kits ended up being 12 tons of compost and. So you can imagine the volume of all of this was just beyond um, our expectations. So having a van that um, is part of the community that you can borrow is actually quite useful because we didn't have the funding for that. And um, we've also been able to apply for funding um, as, as a partnership for things that we wouldn't have been able to get funding for as, a, as, as just Grow 73 on its own. Um, Green in Camden, we, we ended up doing also a QR code, um, which we placed at each of the planters for the bee line. And uh, we've got on it, it sends you to a quiz and we've got four quiz for which are seasonal. So when you go for a walk, you can scan the QR code with your phone, which takes you to a quiz and it tells you what kind of plants or flowers you could find at this time of year around the area where the planter is. And that gets you out and it gives you some kind of interest and structure to your walk if you didn't if you didn't feel like just going out for a walk or something but it's a great thing to do um as an adult with a child for instance um we also uh activists within that area we try to um be a pesticide free area and so we're working with the council to try um, pesticide free along the bee line at least because this is the area where we're trying to increase uh, pollinators and the council were trialing this year hot foam treatment which is um, a kind of foam that you get from um, a kind of formula which is made of um, something like um, uh, vinegar uh, and it's you heat it up and it suffocates the weeds and it, it kills it so we're hoping that this is something that the council is going to take on um, in the future. And so it's all about small changes. I think, I think it's just trying to get people to understand the work that you do, trying to communicate as much as possible, involve people as, as often as possible. We do two sessions per week where we invite people to come and do it's not really um, gardening, it's anything outdoors. So it could be one day picking up, collecting seeds from our wildflowers. It could be scy scything, it could be um, tidying up um, a bed. It could be painting uh, a mural. It could be um, just walking and telling stories. It's just everything um, that will get people out. And people, it's a great opportunity for people to meet friends and exchange knowledge. And I've learned so much from the um, older volunteers who come there who are so passionate in their areas. So I think it's a great, great way to get people, well, to meet new, new people, that's for sure. And lastly, um, we have been, as part of the incredible uh, edible movement I told you about, which was uh, growing in any kind of green patch that you can find, um, Pam Warhurst was part of a, a book which she's just um, made and which will be on sale, I think now or soon um, as part of COP26 called Seed to Solutions. And um, we feature in it um, because the book is, is a kind of recipe book for food, but recipe book for how to set up a community group, what worked, what didn't, um, and it's a it's a really lovely book and it's people from all around the world who um, who are part of this book and it's called um, Seed to Solutions, the Power of Small Actions. And I think that speaks volume about the kind of work that we have been providing in our community. So I hope it's inspired some of you to get started. It's really about small things, starting small. Is This is the first bed that we made 
And as you can see, it's got rhubarb and lavender and thyme and flowers. And you often find people sitting on it, just admiring the flowers. And, and it's just a nice thing to observe when you, when you, you look at it from a distance. Um, so I encourage you to, to get involved in, a, in your community and growing. I, I'm not a gardener by trade and I've just learned by uh, errors and mistakes and things that worked and things didn't, but you learn from actually speaking to other people and engaging with other people. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Eugenie. Thank that you. was just um, very inspirational. There was so much stuff there. I will send everyone out the slides after this session. I was glad you mentioned Incredible Edible as well. We, we do some work with them. They're one of the partners with uh, Sharing Food for Life and Soil Associations project. And they're going to come next year and, and speak. I'm hoping to get people from Incredible Edible and RBS to come next year and then later on in the year, the Eden Project. But you're, when I, I went out to meet Eugenie, and I think, first of all, my colleague, Lorene, was the person sharing the slides for Eugenie, by the way, it wasn't me, because I couldn't get my computer to work either. Computers are playing up today. But um, my colleague, Eugenie, um, Lorene, actually saw Eugenie, I think, and, and told me, oh, you know, you should contact them. And I went out and met with, with Eugenie and went round the park and went round the whole area. And it's amazing. It's just amazing what has been done. And as Eugenie pointed out to me, when she started off, um, she just looked for things for free in the beginning. There's always somebody giving something away. And that helped her very much. And not all of you will want to do a massive big project. The thing is from small beginnings, that's where things start. So it was totally inspiring. So can we put you over to questions and answers across the board? So hands up. I think Alan had his hand up the first time. So do you want to ask a question, Alan? Or you need to put your microphone off? It's mainly a comment, really, that um, for Jenny, really, that some plants people can't handle. But um, I grow a lot of cacti, and not all cacti are thorny and brittle, but they don't need watering a lot, and they produce some wonderful flowers. And I also grow tiladias, which is this. You see, they're air plants. They don't need watering, they need spraying. They don't have roots. You can buy them in Dobie's garden centers and everywhere. So they're all plants that people can handle if they've got arthritic hands, they can handle them and um, it's quite useful. So thank you. That was really useful, uh, cactus, yeah, as well. I've, I've got a forest in my house as well. So it's really useful to know the ones that don't need a, wa a lot of water. Thank you, Alan. And Elaine, would you like to ask a question? Mm -hmm. Elaine, your, your microphone's on mute, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I was just—I was uh, quite interested in uh, the the trestles, the way the way it's all working with them. Uh, we've done a lot with here down Glenboy. I'm not really part of the 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 vegetable and flower and side. Uh, that's the youth that's doing that with the kids. Uh, but after listening to Jenny there. I'm really thinking that I'll maybe start getting involved with that and bring in older people uh, to get involved along with that. Because we have been waiting uh, a good few years now for, we can't call it a main shed anymore, it'll just be a shed. Um, so hopefully uh, the, shed, the shed is going to be in the allotment. So I'm thinking that's what I'll do then, I'll get, I'll get the older people involved with the youth um, after listening to Jenny. Thanks for that. Well, that's amazing and that's really good to know. And honestly, um, please get in touch, Elaine, if there's anything that you, you think, oh, I want to ask something or we might have some resources that might help. 
Mm-hmm. And I'll be sending mm-hmm. out the slides as well. But please get in touch because we always want you know to share. Mm-hmm. I can see some comments. So let's see. Kerry's got her hand up as well. Kerry from Craigie now. Hi. Yeah, I was just wondering if there was any um, tips from um, Jenny about doing like door wreaths. Um, I was thinking about doing um, wreaths as an activity with my residents um, and we're looking to do some like Halloween and some Christmas ones. Um, But I don't really know where to start. So okay uh, that's a very good question um i'm just trying to think we did some work on wreaths i do have something i don't think it's publicly available but i could probably send it to you kerry that's just oh, that would be uh, awesome yeah it's just some uh, different wreaths and how you can make them i think is how it is so it would just give you some kind of pointers and uh, because something some um some ways are easier than others and you could adapt what you know to the suit and the materials that you can get a hold of so and could I perhaps forward that to Bella and she would get it to you yeah that's that's perfect Kerry where are you where is Craig now it's in Perth okay because you might want to even look out like some of your local gardening not centres but there's sometimes gardening projects and there's voluntary organizations that do gardening and they might make wreaths and they might like just let you go along and watch how they're doing that they might oh yeah that, yeah there might be a possibility but along with them um, jenny sending you some information that would be really good i might try and see if i can get something too from a local uh, place that i know of that does work with the community so i'll see if i can find stuff that's perfect. I'm like super new to the job. So I'm still like sort of learning all about like the community and um, people and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. So yeah, no, is that it something perfect. that you would you would think of making intergenerational or would you just be doing it with the residents just now? Obviously with COVID, it's not been so easy to bring people together. Um, so I'm actually in talks with one of the local primary schools um, are looking to come and volunteer every sort of few Fridays. So I was hoping that we could maybe get them involved as well, like partner a child with a resident and, and get them to more do it together. That'd be fun. That'd be real fun to do that. Um, then, yeah. Alan, do you have your hand up again for a question? Yes, just one, just to mention in New Galloway, over the lockdown, they decided they wanted a community garden, but mm-hmm. um, they couldn't really get a community garden because there wasn't anywhere. So with the men's sheds in the local village built boxes and uh, they're about a metre square or two metres square, sorry. And um, people planted them up. So and put vegetables, anything. People can go to the little boxes and pick out a few lettuce and things like that. And it was a great success. And it meant that the village was communicating with the men's shed, which is a good thing to draw people together. Thank that's, you. That's brilliant. And, and that's like a really good example of like an intergenerational shared space in a different way. Spaces and places in your community where older and younger people could mix. Um, I can see that, um, now I don't, You've gone on mute, Bella. Hello there, can you hear me? Um, the person in the potting shed, do you want to ask a question? Did you, I don't have your name. Hi, I'm Carolyn. Um, Carolyn from Community Learning and Development in North Lanarkshire. I'm actually doing intergenerational work in North Lanarkshire um, and it's very successful. It's been running for the last four years. Um, I was so interested I'm actually, it's for Eugenie, because I actually live in G73, I live in Burnside, and I was just, so, that was one of the main reasons I came on, well I was coming on anyway, but this, that was the main reason, because I wanted to know more about those 73, because I have seen the pots around, but I was just wondering if Eugenie could ask, could answer maybe a, a couple of questions, if that's okay, it's just about, you know, the location of the planters, you know, in just some areas, if, you know, if it's extending further than, you know, I don't, I mean, is she there just to have a quick couple of questions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Eugenie, I think, yeah. No, it's so, just, I live, in, I live in the Burnside area, 
and I see the pots around. And I must admit, I was so pleased. During lockdown, I was using Overton Park quite a lot for walks. And I was so pleased to know that you're taking over the bowling greens that have been lying empty for so long. That, I mean, I grew up in that area. And that's, you know, I know a lot about it. And I know how much this park needs that sort of um, involvement, you know, for the community to get back together. Can you tell me, does do you does the, the Grow 73 go beyond the Rutherglen uh, Main Street? Does it go down towards Tory Glen area? No, it doesn't. It goes, no? it does. It does the Cam Glen area, so it's Cambus Lang and Brother Glen. Uh -huh. uh, we haven't gone down there just because it, it's I'm the only one who manages the whole charity, and right. I rely solely on my um, um, volunteers. So capacity is quite low, uh -huh. uh, but we work we work with other organisations like Health and Happy, and uh, right. all, Leap is a big intergenerational. Um, Charity um, and uh, local schools. Why did you want to go, to work towards Tory Glen? No, no, no. What I'm thinking about is coming from this area. I live in Burnside, and I see all the activity round about. Burnside's a little, you know. I, I feel as though the Tory Glen area is an area that really should be, you know, put a lot of attention on because yeah. of the deprivation. You know, and I feel that something like this, especially around health, well-being, it would be, you know, getting in touch with local schools, you know, to try and, you know, just do something a bit further further in that area. I mean, yeah. probably Canvas Lang, places you are going there, you know, there's a lot of sort of major pockets of deprivation, you know, so that's that's good to hear as well. But I just think it's a fantastic project. And um, I really am so excited about seeing the transformation with the Bowling Greens because, I mean, for people that don't know that area, this is a, a major achievement you've got, you've had and just want to thank you and all the volunteers that help out, you know, in your project. It's, it's amazing. You're thank doing you. so well. Thank you. Come and see us. Oh, well, no, this is the thing I wanted to ask as well, sorry. What sessions per, what's a minute? He says two sessions per week. What days of the week are they? Monday and Thursday mornings, 10, 10 to about 1. And we're hoping that once we've got the land, it will be open to every day. Okay. And where would, where would the meeting point be? In the park. At, in at, Overton in, Park? In, yeah, on the land. Do you know what? I will come down. So between 10 and 1 o'clock. Yeah. I'll definitely do it. I'll pop down. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, that's that's excellent to hear that. And and like I suppose like every probably many areas in Scotland, um, you know, I'm I'm within Inverclyde area and there's quite a few things going on here and different um kind of projects, but then um, it'd be quite nice, like Eugenie says, if anyone knows a piece of land that's not been used, it could be used and planted things planted in. It'll just make the place so much more attractive. And one of the things I'd like to share before I move on is that um, I've seen in a lot of local council areas where there have been high areas of deprivation and there have been high areas of unemployment and there have been difficulties in communities and vast young people let's all grow it and go and grow some wildflowers let's cheer that area up maybe it's been vandalized maybe it's not feeling safe in a park and there's glass broken and there's issues and it's definitely made a big difference so these are all the things you can think about as well small but doable things in your own community that could make a massive difference and I think it was uh, Jenny that pointed out when you look at flowers in your house, it's meant to lower your blood pressure. So imagine what that would do if all the unsightly places in your community starts on. We have a green revolution of people who are going out and they're always activists in the community saying, right, let's do these bee bombs. When I went to Rutherglen and seen these huge, and they're huge, great big um, plant pots, for want of a better word, with all the, all the plants growing in them, it was amazing and I've told people about them and they said, oh, I've never heard of that before. So maybe more councils will pick up on that and involve everyone. It's going to be good for blood pressure, I think, you know, across the B-line. And the B-line leads straight to the station, which Jenny took me to, to see where it went to. And it's amazing. So now if we've got, oh yeah, Louisa, you've got a question as well. So Louisa Turner, you have a question. Hi, mine isn't actually a question. It's just saying, you know, 
Bella was saying, contact the council if you see an area of land. Um, I'm with a church in Dunfermline and it was the council that was walking past us um, when we were in the car park and we're just saying, what are you doing with your car park? It looks a bit messy. And we're saying, oh, we'd love to create something, but we don't have the people to do it. So now we're working in partnership with the council um, and with the local area as well to transform the car park. So it's not just council land. Um, if you see sort of like an organisation that perhaps the, the members are older who can't physically do things and maybe they're fewer in, in number as well, you know, working in partnership, building up together and um, coming together and might create something more attractive in the community. And that's a project I'm working on at the moment as well. Just to say, it's not always the obvious just take a, a look around your community and think, oh, that's a little bit messy. Could we help there? And then just go ahead and approach them. All they can say is, no, thank you. No, that's right. And a lot of, um, I mean, I've been out to visit quite a few nursing homes here recently. And um, one was in Sanquhar in Ayrshire. Been out to quite a lot of places. And they have said they needed to help with our garden. And it was a bit run down and stuff like that. So I suggested to them, why don't you advertise for volunteers? Now that's intergenerational as well. If you get somebody who's in their 20s or their 30s, whatever, and they might not be employed at the moment, it'll give them sort of feeling the pride of something that they're doing, but also learning skills, but also helping. So there's a, quite a lot of work that can be done across the board. Now, listen, Halliday had her hand up. So what I'm going to do is Emma's our speaker as well. So first of all, Emma, do you have a question? No, it was just, uh, no, sorry, I missed the name of the person that was um, asked the question that's iPhone, but it was just to say that Urban Roots are doing work and they do work in the Tory Glen area. So if you are interested in what's going on there, it's worth um, speaking to Urban Roots, um, who are another Glasgow based um, charity that do lots of growing, growing work across particularly the south side of the city. Absolutely, and there's someone who's coming next to you as well to speak, so this is really good that you've mentioned them as well. So what I'll do now is, I can see that, um, sorry, um, does anyone else have any more questions before we move on to let Emma speak? Okay, so Emma, the, the, the floor is over to you. So this is Emma Halliday and she's going to speak from um, Green Space Scotland. Thank you. Hello, hi everyone. Before I start, I was inspired by Jenny. So I've brought, I just brought over my windowsill um, planting. So I've got, we've got orchids uh, on my windowsill that cheer me up. Um, and similar, they like a bit of a spray of water, don't need as much care as you would think they do. So, so to start, hello everyone. Firstly, thanks so much for um, inviting me to speak today. It's lovely to see um, so many people. I'm the program manager at Green Space Scotland. Um, and just to give you a wee introduction um, to Green Space Scotland, we are a, we're a charity. We're based, well, we're ordinarily we're based in Stirling, but at the moment we're all home working. So we're all we have people working from uh, one colleague on call, another one in North Berwick, another one up in Aberdeenshire. So we're all um, we're dotted all over the country, um, and we are um, we work to ensure um, that everyone in Scotland has access to quality um, green space that they can enjoy. Um, as part of that, we also um, support the Tesco. Uh, community funding in Scotland. My role is the coordinator of that, that programme and I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about that today um, and then at the end there's some time for some questions so if you're if you've got other general questions about Green Space Scotland and what we do then um, please please do ask. Um, I just wanted to say thanks as well to Jenny and Eugenie they've done a really great job to, for, for me to explain you know what the joy of food growing and gardening can bring and the benefits of that and um, so that was great that was a, a great job for me I don't have to say too much about that um, I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully can everybody see that 
Yes, I can see it. Oh, great, thank you. Right, and I'm just hoping it'll, it'll, oh no, I'm thinking it, I'm hoping it was going to move forward, but it's not. Oh, hold on. Just when you think things are going to go to plan. Ah, oh, there we go, right. So I'm just going to say a little bit first, before I go on to the bit about funding, I just want to say a wee bit about where my own interest in um, community-led action and funding um, came from. Um, so this is a, a fairly recent picture of our local park. Um, I live in Glasgow and this is Hayburn Play Park. Um, about 14 years ago, I got involved in Hayburn Play Park Association. Um, this is a really local community um, park um, and it's always had since the 80s we've had seasonal events in the park um, but unfortunately um, when I joined the association the park itself was getting really run down I hadn't had much investment in it and um, it's a really really important community asset to us so um, we wanted to develop it and incorporate um, natural space play spaces in it and we also wanted the park to be for the whole community not just for um, parents with young children we wanted to welcome everybody into the park and have things that would attract everybody there so we also wanted to integrate some food growing spaces what we did um, we um, worked with a, a landscape designer and a play specialist and we developed a plan for the entire park um, incorporating um, fruit growing areas, fruit trees, um, seats and benches, a kind of uh, performance area and we got that plan together and over a, a couple, well it's probably about two or three years, um, we worked with the council to convince them they accepted the plan um, and the, the budget we had to raise was about 100,000 to make it happen. And we worked with lots of people in our community um, and we, we, we did make it happen. Um, so the park has been really transformed. We continue to run events in it. We do just recently we've had two outdoor cinema events and we've also had um, we had a little mini music festival a couple of weeks ago so this what we we did in our park and what we achieved there really convinced me the difference that local people can make in their communities um, and I was really interested in how to support that it's led to me meeting so many people in my, my community and um, it's also let me meet loads of interesting people further afield by complete coincidence i met eugenie about four four or five years ago in cornwall um at, at a community camp that uh, eugenie mentioned so we we met down there and um have i um, have known each other ever since and i've been inspired by all the work that grow 73 do um so I've, about now, five years ago, I, I applied for a job at Green Space Scotland um, and I was successful in getting that job, which was great. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the Tesco Community Grant funding. Um, that's enough about me now. Um, and there's three organisations involved in it. There's um, Green Space Scotland, Tesco itself, and also Groundwork, who are based in England. They don't do any delivery of anything in Scotland, and that's why Green Space Scotland are, in, are involved in that. Now, you might be aware of the funding, probably you might be more aware of it as Tesco Bags of Help, which was how it was launched um, six years ago, but it's just recently changed to Tesco Community Grants, and there's been a shift in the kind of priority focus of um, the projects that we fund. So it's changed um, to focus on children, young people and families, and also food, food security projects. So within that, that includes, very much includes intergenerational um, projects and um, definitely things around food growing and working with um, young and old um, to do food growing or projects that alleviate food poverty. 
So originally when it launched, um, it was it came from the carrier bag tax. So it was something that that all um, supermarkets um, and, and shops had to do. They had to put their um, the money from their um, plastic bags towards good causes. Um, in 2017, Tesco um, scrap their single use carrier bags and they now use the money from their bag for life sales towards um, all the projects. And from the start, um, we've now given out, and this is just in Scotland, we've given out 12 million um, to more than 580, not 580, sorry, 5,800 projects. And um, that includes actually Grow 73 and Trellis. They've both received funding um, through um, the Tesco um, fund. So we're delighted we're able to work with so many groups and um, it's a nice job to be able to give out funding. Um, and we, as I said, there has been a shift. So now applications, although you could still apply for other projects, the projects that are prioritised are ones that focus on children, young people, families and food um, security. And that includes um, a whole range of range of things. Um, it, it can include food banks, breakfast clubs, sustainable food projects. Um, it includes um, growing projects, um, community gardens, orchards. So there is a range of things in there. Um, and it would also include things like food get together. So again, intergenerational things, as long as you're in, involving young people and old people, um, then you'd be, allowed, you, you'd be eligible to apply for projects um, like that. You can apply up to 1,500 pounds. So it's a good fund for people that are just starting out on a journey, um, probably where Eugenie was six years ago it's a good um fund for that that can give you a kind of start starting um help to see you know is this something you want to continue or you want to just do a small project and at the moment because we've just relaunched um in a lot of our areas we we have um a huge number of areas in scotland and um, we don't actually have any applications for some of the the food food security projects. So now is also a really good time to apply for those type of projects because in certain areas, we, do, we don't have any projects in at the pot at the moment. So it means that you've got a much higher chance of um, getting some funding. So just as a little inspiration, we've had, we've had community food growing projects and um, we've had school outdoor learning projects. We've had um, orchard growing projects and we've also had um, at school or um, out summertime activity projects for for young people. Um, there's not just me working on um, the Tesco community grants pro program we've got there's a team of four community enablers and um, myself and um, we each have a different patch to cover so um, this is Rita. She um, lives up near a Boyne and she covers the kind of northeast Fife and she's got Orkney and Shetland. So she's the kind of friendly person that can help you out if you're from that area. Um, Sue is covers the most of the kind of central uh, north south Lanarkshire and the borders and Dumfries and Galloway. And Tamara, Tamara's got a big patch. Tamara actually lives on call, but she um covers glasgow edinburgh the west coast and the highlands and i um, i'm just delighted i've got such a great team and i kind of help out across all those areas so our job is to really help people apply to support them to apply um and also if they're if they've got any difficulties in delivering their project and um, then we can help with that we've got a huge range of skills between the four of us and I, I suppose the most important thing to say is that we're here to help help you if you're unsure whether your application would be suitable or um, you, you just need a bit of help with the application process then we can do that and I will share in the chat the link um, to our page that allows you to contact um, any of us um, if you want to get in touch and have a chat with us.
we work closely with the Tesco team of community champions. Not all stores have a community champion, but some of them do. And again, they can be a really helpful person um, locally to you. Um, and they can, you know, things like giving donations to your projects. They also, the four of us can't be connected to every local community organizations across Scotland. It's absolutely impossible. So they are our kind of more local contacts that help us and can put people in touch with us. They are again, um, really friendly, helpful people um, in your Tesco store. So who can apply? Um, a whole range of people can apply really for the project. The main thing is you really have to be not for profit. Um, that includes uh, community organizations, charities, um, local authorities, social housing providers, and also social enterprises can apply. So there's a big range. And as I said, you can apply up to 1,500 pounds. So how do you actually apply for the funding if you're interested? Now, this process, I would say over the, the, the five years I've been working on it, I would say it's like Marmite. Um, it's basically some people love it and other people hate it. Um, so I never say it's a simple process because for some people it isn't. It's all online. Um, you go to the website and you, you click on apply for a grant and you there's a three-stage process that you have to you first of all do a little check and it does a wee check to see whether your project is going to be eligible and um, you have to identify a local um, Tesco store but anyone in Scotland can apply you don't have to have a Tesco in your town or your village or your community you can just pick one that's near near to you so there's no um, barrier from that and my, my point around this I suppose is that if you're having any difficulty with doing it online or having difficulty with the application process, we can help you with that. We have uh, instances where we've um, talked people through it on the phone um, if they're not keen on using their computer, um, but we're here to help with that. Um, but unfortunately, one thing we can't do, it does have to be done online. Um, there's no way around that. So in terms of the projects and what's eligible, um, Projects have to be based in Scotland, England, or Wales. Our team support the projects in Scotland. Um, you have to, once you actually get your funding from Tesco, if you're successful, you have to spend it within 12 months. Usually that's not a problem with the level of funding that we give out. There's no restriction on match funding. So you could have a project that you've already got 10,000 pounds in and you just need a little bit more that's not a problem and um, you can apply um, for that and you can apply for capital and revenue costs so it could be actually buying equipment and delivering a project but it also could be for things around promotion of your project or volunteer expenses or sessional workers to deliver a project so there, there's quite good flexibility there um, for applying And some tips for you if you are thinking about applying. Um, I would just say, just make sure you're clear about what you actually want to do with the money. Um, and also be clear around whether, how you're working with children, young people or families. Um, and again, make sure you, if you're doing one around food security or food sustainability, food growing, that you mention that. And you also, um, as much as possible, try to see how you're working intergenerationally on projects like that are involving um, children, young people and families. Um, don't use too much jargon. I think what really works is, you know, just communicating your story. Um, why is the project needed? What the difference will make? Um, is, is very important. And lastly, there's a bit where you're asked to give your project a title and a one line description. Now, they are really important when if you get shortlisted because they're what people see in store and they are where you really have to sell, sell your project. So thinking about those is, is quite important. Um, kind of uniquely I think with the Tesco program we work with the staff in stores to shortlist um, so we have community we have shortlisting meetings with the store staff they know their communities 
they know the groups and so um, they work with us to decide which projects are shortlisted for their store. So if you're if you apply and you're shortlisted, um, then what happens is every every three months, um, three projects go to, to vote in each of the areas. So we have 87 areas um, in Scotland. So every every three months we award around 261,000 out to 261 groups in Scotland. So there's a lot of opportunities to apply um, and a lot of projects get funded through the programme. You um, are, your details are put in a voting unit in store and the customers um, put blue token in each time they shop, they can, they can get given a blue token and they vote for the project that they, they feel most strongly about. Um, as soon if you're shortlisted for voting, you automatically um, will get definitely get five hundred pounds because the third place gets five hundred pounds, second place gets um, up to a thousand pounds, and first place gets up to one thousand five hundred pounds. And I suppose one of the other tips I would say is we always encourage people ideally to apply for the full one thousand five hundred so that if they do come first, they will get the full uh, money. You don't have to, if your project is only costing a thousand pounds, you don't have to um, apply for the full amount. Um, and this, the other great thing about um, the, the in-store voting is what we've found from groups is it gives, uh, it's a really good opportunity for you to promote your group and to tell people in your community who you are, what you're doing. It gives you quite a good profile in store and it can lead to you um, getting additional volunteers or interest in the project and what you're doing. So that's um, quite a quick uh, run through. Um, that's my, my email, but I, as I said, I'll also um, drop in the chat. I'll drop my email in the chat and I'll drop my a couple of links, one to the application form and another to our page on our website, which gives you the details of um, the Community Enabler team. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, um, then please um, do ask. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Jen. Um, I've lost my place here what a silly person emma emma i was going to call you jenny there all right, so, all right. any questions from anyone for for emma somebody has something in the oh you've gone on mute oh that's weird right okay uh, sorry um would it be possible to get the contacts for rita sue and tamara or or can these be um, found online? I, does anyone know what that is? Yes, yeah, so I I will, um, I'm just gonna put in the chat here a link um, that takes you to the page of our website. So on our website, um, you if you follow that link there, or copy that link, or if you go onto our website under, um, in fact, if I've, it's, I'm gonna just quickly, um, look and see it's under it sits our, our also our inner staff page actually if you look at you know about us and go to staff you'll have all our contact details but also if you go to get involved and um, which is one of the menu things mm -hmm. and fund your project that will take you to our page as well um, and you can get all our our details um, and i'm just going to quickly drop into chat um the link as well to the Tesco to the actual website, which is a, a different place if you were wanting to just take a look at the application process. Um, Lorraine's asking, no, Louisa was asking if a faith group would be um, considered for a, a, a grant. And I said yes, because I don't see why they wouldn't, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, they will, as long as they're a constituted group. Then we've applied. Then faith groups have been funded. Um, they've done. They've do a lot of really good work in the community, and so they have been funded. But you need to have, as a kind of for informal community group, you need to have a constitution. So that's one thing that you do need to have in place. 
Now that's handy to know for anyone that isn't on. And what if this has happened before with me with community groups, they haven't been constituted, they've got another organisation. Are they allowed to do that, to take the money for them? Yes, so we've done that in the past as well. So another organisation, like an a parent organisation or maybe a church, or then they have applied on behalf of um, more informal community groups and that's absolutely fine. Well, that's really helpful. That was really interesting to hear. I love to hear about Hayburn Play Park as well. Um, all that at the beginning was just so inspiring. And again, what's happening across the communities is all these spaces and places are opening up. And as you rightly say, it's in a generation because it's a whole community. So you're bringing everyone in really in different ways. They feel welcomed. And I remember um, it must be 18 years ago now that I worked with a community group helping them uh, write a funding application for a community park um, and in a local kind of little area where they lived in, in Greenock. And um, they wanted to make, it was a community park, but they wanted to have a place for older people to sit who lived in that community and flowers in the garden area. And even now to this day, it was only the park that was built. They were a way ahead of their time, that group, in thinking about the local community. And I think now, you can see that it's it's for everyone. Play doesn't stop. And um, there's lots of studies. Japan comes up a lot. But when older people can see younger people playing and they can be amongst younger people, it's quite a nice atmosphere. And it brings back memories for them just, you know, just to be part of that and watch little ones. I mean, I've, I've got the joy of um, having grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And as my, oh, my older granddaughter, granddaughter's 24 and I've got little ones coming up but like um, I've got friends who don't have children very close friends and they chose not to have children but everyone should be feel like they're part of the community in, in some ways so using these spaces and places is amazing so any more questions for from anyone yes Isabel McKenzie you need to take yourself on off mute hi thank you Bella um Yes, I was going to say, I put a comment in the chat line earlier about um, uh, local funding, if, if, if anyone, I mean, there's, there's obviously a really good one with the Tesco uh, community funding, but I had a query about with the local play parks here in Highland, it's been a hot topic over the last um, few years since I've become a councillor, and I've been dealing in my ward, particularly with one uh, resident who's been campaigning to try and keep a very small play park open. And hearing today's um, seminar has actually given me <laughs> food for thought in, in quite a lot of ways because they are looking at the budget cuts and what play parks are going to be kept and what can't be sustained so hearing what you've been discussing this morning is actually really really important because it's making me then realize that some of these spaces regardless of how small they are or whatever if there is that community network this uh, workshop today has really given me um, new ideas to actually perhaps channel that because you know, they're discussing about, I mean, I'm campaigning to keep these spaces regardless if the equipment can't be maintained, but could I then ensure that we keep them as safe spaces for local residents so that children can go and play, kick a ball, whatever. And that has been my um, campaign is to, to call them safe spaces, you know, don't just block them off and leave them to overgrow. So, um, I'm really, it'd be interesting to hear what other areas have said about play parks, because I know we're campaigning at the moment and there's meant to be more funding coming, but unfortunately um, we can't, we can't sustain them all. And if there's two play parks very near each other in some of my wards, they are literally saying that will stay, that won't stay. But what I would like to see perhaps now then is can we maintain them and then obviously reinterpret them into some other space if if that's possible so this has been really 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 useful for me but local funding there is there are lots of pockets of local funding and obviously I've been involved with a lot of different charities over the last few years so again is there a way of perhaps pulling together I feel it's all about communicating and networking and I often think left and right aren't always 
um, communicating and I feel I've been a facilitator, but it's it's trying to pull together what, what pockets of funding are available that people might not be thinking about. And that often comes up with local communities with me is where they can go, how they can get the funding. And yes, sometimes they need a bit of help. So I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Well, thank you, Isabel, for that. Emma, yes. I just wanted to add, uh, thanks, Isabel. It's really good to hear it because I, I, I mean, I, I am such an advocate for um, community urban or, or no urban, um, those spaces like that and how important they are just we our parks serve so many functions we have or we have we know we when we did the development of it we had we had a partnership with the council that the the more natural features we put in we as a community are responsible for those the council isn't so we have fruit bushes fruit trees we have willow and um, interestingly the thing around um the wreaths we we do a willow um weaving um, activity every year and we take all the willow off and then we, we do a workshop and make wreaths from that willow and um, we have an outdoor table tennis thing a table now we have a little mini library in our park so there are there are so many functions a park can have beyond just the play equipment um, and and yeah they're very important i also very quickly wanted to add we do a, a monthly e-bulletin that you can sign up on our website and that has we pull out a lot of um community funding within that um as well um targeted kind of food growing and um, green spaces so that's a good um, place to find uh, funding information excellent and also the project that we're involved in along with incredible edible rbs um, the Eden Project and in Lincoln Generations Northern Ireland with Food for Life get togethers. Um, I know that 11 people, um, I know that many people put in for the funding recently just £150 for community groups and some of them, they changed the date on it and some of them never got, but 11 people from Generations Working Together Network applied for the funding and eight people received the funding and I know that the next year will have some larger sums, so it's worth thinking about that Isabel as well for the park because it's about spaces and places, it's about reinventing and I think I think what you were saying was like you know it's like reinvigorating or looking at a new way to use that space and I think COVID will be the perfect excuse to keep it open because it's like an outdoor space and if we want people to connect and they're worried about connecting indoors at least they can go somewhere outdoors to connect and we're looking at as Lorreen is, is our person who really looks at um, you know children and young people like early years across Scotland we all know the 2020 hours is doubled the hours in childcare, and a lot of the work is done and it's in outdoors it's about outdoors. So all the more reason to keep those parks open, you know, across everywhere and, and, and you know, get inspired and get community involved. Uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about it because we can see, well, what I can see, I've had an allotment before for many years when I was a student and when I was younger. And uh, what I can see is a groundswell of a movement that is looking at how we look at our environments and how we involve all our community and again, Isabel, you're probably steeped in policy and strategy around isolation and loneliness. But if we can use the policy and the strategy to convince the funders, well, actually, this space will. It will do a lot, you know, to do with isolation, loneliness, better, greener Scotland, uh, good food policies. It just covers so much. So, you know, today's been a really good session. The, the speakers, Eugenie, Eugenie, by the way, people are asking about reef making and I saw that Eugenie had put in the chat that she actually, they do the reef making too. So um, Emma's put her details in the chat as well, but what I'll do is send out after this, everyone's PowerPoint, all the details for contact. Um, trellis are amazing. Uh, Jean, uh, Joan came out with me in my first year at GWT and came to lots of my network meetings and, and did demonstrations. And, and the simplest of things and to get young people and older people talking about things too. I think we had purple carrots, Jenny. So that was pretty um, interesting. So I think um, I was going to show you stuff from Soil Association, but I'm just going to send it. Um, this is um, 
taste and share, no, share and, share and cook. So this month is share and cook, and it's all about sharing and cooking and sharing with others. Um, we would say share with other generations, but it's, if possible, I'll send the information on share and cook rather than keep you all going. So does anyone have any more questions before we finish up? Because what I think we'll do is I'll put our evaluation in, in the chat for people to do, to fill in. And I can see that there's six things in the chat. So um, Jump Chapel, yeah. Um, Grow Drum and Jump Chapel opened up on Saturday with people signing up for allotment plots also play part for the community. Brilliant. Brilliant. And that's from Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. And Kathleen and I have had communications for a while and then we never, ever got meeting because COVID happened and everything all just fell apart. Um, and so um, with Tamara from the Highland areas, it would be good to be in touch with Tamara. So that's good. So there's a load of things happening here, people trying to get in touch. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put our, um, our evaluation in the chat because we need you. We need to ask you how the session was. Please fill it in if you can. Um, I'll send it out by email too for those who can't. And um, I would think after, after that, people can actually go because it's been a long morning. We didn't do breakout rooms for a change. And what I would hope is that I'll send you some booklets for World Food Day and some information so that you can share with your own networks about World Food Day when it happens. It's an important movement and it's important that we realise that even although we're having experience in difficult times in our own communities, there are people who are much worse off. But even although that doesn't take away from the fact that we are trying very hard to uh, bring our communities together. Oh, yes. And John, Lorraine has kindly reminded me that John is going to share something with us. I'm so sorry, John. So would you like to share now while people are filling in the evaluations? John Mitchell from Improvement Service in, in Scotland uh, is going to share. Oh, that's brilliant, Bella. Thanks very much for inviting me along today. Um, if I can just share my screen quickly. Okay, is that visible? No, what's happened? Oh, hold on, let me see. Don't worry. Yes. Is that, that it? Great. Yes, that's it. So um, this is just a very quick plug more than anything else for an event, which hopefully some people might be interested in. So as Bella said, I'm John Mitchell from the Improvement Service. Um, we're the delivery partner for uh, Money and Pension Service in Scotland for this new network called Money Guiders. So um, Money Guiders is, um, hold on a second. Money Guiders is really for anybody that's providing money advice or helping anybody with money worries. And they can be from the voluntary third or public sector. So they can be helping really anybody and it could be at any particular level. They don't need to be doing it full time. It can be part time. Um, it can just be a very small part of what they do. So this new network um, is really trying to help those guiders in any way that they can, providing peer support, um, networking opportunities. Um, and as part of that, there's a, a program that sits behind it. The, the network's part of three elements. There's a competency framework for people to self-assess themselves, uh, develop an action plan, help with personal development. And then there's an online learning hub with uh, various modules to um, help fill in those blanks and um, improve their learning um, and increase their, their pathways to, to learning as well. Um, the Money Guiders Network is the element which we're working on. Um, as I said, that has a range of different events and meetings. Um, we're hosting normally between one and two events a month at the minute. Um, and that's a mixture of information sessions. Um, and that can be in a range of different topic areas. Uh, networking events, which everybody's welcome to come along. Um, and we have a few breakout sessions on speed networking elements to try and get people to, to talk to each other. Um, and also workshops as well, which we'll be moving forward into uh, the new year. And for Top Money Week, which is coming up, um, early November, uh, we're also having the first UK conference for Money Guiders. So there are four networks across the UK um, <clears throat> and we're coming together with the other three networks um, just to take part in that. We also got a, an online community which is being developed on the Knowledge Hub um, and people are more than welcome to join there and they can take their discussions further and access other learning opportunities. So I think 
one of the things you might be interested in is we've got an event coming up in October on the 19th. Um, and this is titled using a cash first approach to address food insecurity. So we have the independent food aid network coming along. We've got um, Marie Marshall, who will be talking about their project and how that's actually developed. Um, they have a range of cash first leaflets. I'll show you a few examples in a minute or so. And they've co-developed these worrying about money leaflets within local authority areas with a whole range of partners. So um, they're really pretty clear, concise leaflets, which can be issued out by support workers and volunteers. And in particular, that, can, that has happened out through food banks. I'll share the, the link to the event. If anybody's uh, willing to click on that, they can, they can register and come along. That'd be great to see people. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, I'm not going to do it in detail, um, but the cash referral leaflets aim to reduce the need for emergency food aid by helping people access any existing financial entitlements and advice on income maximisation. And you can see there, there are a range of local authority areas which have already developed leaflets within their areas. Um, there's quite a few there, I think there's 16 or 17. I suspect they're expanding that out even further. Um, Marie will talk about those, how they've been developed, and also a review of that programme as well. Here's an example from Highland. So these leaflets um, ask, you know, what's the problem? So you can self-assess in terms of, you know, suddenly got no money, money doesn't go far enough, I have debt, and then move forward to the second step. What are the options open to you? Um, <clears throat> What are they available in terms of uh, a hardship payment or maximizing your income? It really depends, obviously, on what the issue is. And then the third step, where can you get help? And that's localized within that particular local authority area, whether it's your local council, um, or whether it's citizen advice, um, or whether there's other support. And as you can see, there's a range of partners that have been involved in this particular one. Um, so very quickly, that was just a, a rapid plug. Um, if anybody's interested in the network, by all means, visit our website or visit the Knowledge Hub and just search for Money Guiders and you'll be able to access it there. And as I say, my name's the John Mitchell at the bottom of uh, the slide. I'll put a link into the, the chat as well. So, Bella, thank you very much. This was just a very rapid run through. Appreciate your uh, keeping an eye on time. Thank you for that, John. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll share all the PowerPoints with everyone. And does anyone have any questions for John? I think everyone's tired. So if you want to um, stop sharing your screen, um, we can send out your, your PowerPoint to people. Um, I think a lot of people have to run and, and Kerry's saying thank you for the, the new knowledge. Thanks, Kerry. And uh, I would just say, look, we're going to, next year, we're concentrating largely on ageism. What John shared with us there, I thought was really important because we are working in communities and, and not everyone's in the position that they're, you know, they're, they're doing well financially and things are difficult. And, and this falling on from food insecurity, I felt as if when John contacted me, I thought well, it fits. It fits with anything to share that information out there for communities to know about it. And I know that Social Security Scotland have been in touch too. And at the moment, their campaign is in, uh, looking at um, sort of income maximisation for older people and uh, younger people with disabilities. So if I get any of that information, I'll be sharing it out as well, because it's just so important that, you know, people are connected and, as we know, the link between poverty and isolation is high. So it's another area, you know, that it needs a bit of focus too. Thank you. And Lorraine's just said, really interesting to hear from you, John. And I actually nearly forgot that you were going to plug because Lorraine had to remind me there because I haven't got my sheet in front of me this morning. Thank you to Jenny. Thank you to Eugenie and uh, Emma who are all gone now. And thanks to everyone. 
If anyone wants to contact me and if anything that they want to ask, please get in touch. I'm going to send out quite a bit of information. And, and Kathleen from Cope, thanks so much for saying thank you. Everybody's been so kind this morning. So, um, you know, spread the word and, and spread the word that it's, it's not just very small children and very old people that's intergenerational. It's our whole community. And uh, I would say that, you know, a lot of young people in their 20s you know, would probably benefit greatly from joining a project to work with people in their 50s or whatever, just bringing the community together. So thank you. And uh, thanks very much, Alan. You always come and I'm so glad that you do. and You contribute so well. So it's good to see you here again. Felt a bit lost. I was about the only cockerel in the hen house this morning, I think. <laughs> I think you may be right. Yeah, <laughs> apart from John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that happens a lot, I must say. But you know, the stories that you shared this year, some of the things that happen in your community have inspired so many. And that's what it's about. That's what these networks are about. They belong to you guys. You know, when we're in our own communities, we haven't got time to go and look everywhere else. And that's what we're about. We're about connecting people and finding out ways. So thank you, Alan. So Everyone can go home now <laughs> and get a cup of tea <laughs> and uh, hopefully catch up soon. I know that Lorene's working at a project and um, she's doing something on, is it Thursday, Lorene? Thursday, yeah. We have um, intergenerational projects based around play and storytelling with the focus on play and storytelling um, being for all ages, something we need connecting us through our whole of life, which I have to say has proved extremely popular and is booked to the max at the moment, but we will hopefully have a recording from the speakers as well and that will be shared at some point too, so let me know if you would be interested in that and you haven't actually been able to book. Um, so yes, we have that and then we have um, more thematic meetings later in the month around uh, COP26. COP26, yeah and uh, some spaces and places things. Thanks to Fiona Brown who had real issues with the hearing and our, our, you know the volume and things like that and other people who had tech issues. I hope next year we're out there and, and I'll come and visit everyone in the community and we'll maybe have some more hands-on things. So let's hope for the future. Well, so we can well, all go now. Oh, sorry. So can I just say one last thing to end on? And it's a real nice happy, it's a very nice, happy piece of good news I've actually just received. One of the, group, one of the groups that I work with, I'm community learning development and I work with um, children and families birth to five years. I've actually got a group, um, a garden group, the Forget Me Not Intergenerational Garden Group. We've been running for three, four years. I put them forward for the Sustain Learning for Sustainability Award. It's tying in with COP26 and we've just found out we've been shortlisted. So we are over the moon about it and we had we had our online um on friday we had our online judging session and i was lucky enough to bring eight of the group together with you know like all the different generations in one room sharing one laptop all walking up you know doing their little speech telling everyone about you know what they're getting from the group and apart from if we don't go any further than this to be shortlisted throughout the whole of scotland is an absolutely superb achievement. And that's what intergenerational is about. The look on the, the faces of all the different generations in this group and the way they describe the group and what they're getting from it actually touched my heart because you, as a worker, you always think, are you doing you know, the right thing? Are they taking in what you're telling them? You know, are they enjoying it? I was absolutely overwhelmed with what they all, they all spoke from the heart. And it was about their own story, which I thought was even more exceptional. And their own sort of, um, you know, things that are preventing them from maybe, you know, they're, they're involved in the group in a great way, but they've also got barriers. You know, it can be sort of health barriers, which are the main ones, but they, they're all overcoming that to do a garden group. And I just wanted to share that lovely piece of news. So fingers crossed, you never know. You're on mute, Bella. <laughs> Can't even hear me again. Everyone's doing this today, aren't they? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Brilliant. And, and 
absolutely keep in touch let us know because Kate could get in touch to do a case study on you but also I would encourage you to apply for our excellence awards for next year because that's that's exactly the criteria and we would be delighted to hear more about that just well, probably, do. you just sound you. Really inspired I think I need a gardening job I need to be out and amongst the the, the community so but thank you so everyone um we can all go home we can all go now and I would hope that to see you all again you know hopefully in person it's so lovely to see so many of you and hopefully we'll get more men next time Alan and, and John <laughs> so but thank you thanks thank you. Bye. great session thank you